Hello and welcome to another <laughs> movie review from MB Today, John. Tonight, John, we are going to be talking about 1999's Arlington Road, directed by Mark Pellington, starring the brilliant Jeff Bridges, the brilliant Tim Robbins, and equally brilliant Joan Cusack. Um, I know yes. that you've watched this film recently, John. It's been a few years since I watched Stephen, it. I watched it the early hours of this morning. This, that's how keen I am about you. Yeah. Obviously, Jeff Bridges and Tim Robbins. And the reason we're doing it is, is because it dropped into the conversation, I think, last week, didn't it? When we were doing the review last yeah. week. Um, and we, we just went, it. let's do it. Why not? Yeah. Okay, so why not? So yes. I'd just like to welcome all our YouTube uh, followers and, of course, our Twitch followers as well. We're multi streaming here at MBE these days. We're yes. getting with the kids <laughs> and all that. But um, I'm going to pass it over to you, John, anyway, um, uh, to der- uh, just to take us through this uh, this review experience. As I said, um, on a week there. One of the things what could um, go wrong? this film came out in 1999, and we were talking, I think, about a month ago or something like that. We were talking about all the great films that did come out in 1999. Yes. And we didn't mention this one. And the reason for that Matrix. And Matrix. Phantom Menace, Fight Club, etc., etc., Sixth Sense. Um, this is probably why this film suffered. It also suffered as well, I think, because it was delayed due to a. I can't remember what bombing it was. A bombing Oklahoma. that happened. I'm not sure, John, um, mm. but it was delayed by six months, and I think that had an effect on the film's I think actual Oklahoma performance. Oklahoma may have been 96. Was it the Richard Jewell inspired it, bombing? I, it, I'd have to look it up to be honest with you, but there was an event, you know, that um, delayed this film by six months. Um, interestingly, um, I was watching an interview with Mark Pellington on this, and so the film made its money back. Um, it, it didn't make a profit. It didn't make a loss. It just made it back. And uh, this was a, a time um, when a lot of films like this were out. You know, um, this is a thriller, of course. Yeah. Um, that kind of went under the radar. This certainly did with a lot of people. Um, what I will say is that if for the people who have not seen this, we're going to be talking obviously, uh, you know, spoiler, spoiler heavy. Think, yes. But what I will say is, um, I go and see this film before you see this review. Um, but what I can say is, just before maybe he's want to turn it off, is that we'll this that, has a shocking beginning and a stunning ending. So I'm going to pass it over to you now, Stephen, John. Stephen, it, it does what I love my movie to do. It starts with a real bang, if you pardon the pun, because there is a literal bang. For mm. the Lang's young son. He loses his thumb by the looks of it, grotesquely, with a firework display. He says it's a firework display, of course. Yeah. It could be, as the context of this movie frames later on, it could be something a little bit more malevolent yeah. than a firework. But he loses his thumb, so it starts with a bang, really quickly paced. We've got uh, Michael Faraday, played by the magnificent Jeff Bridges, driving along the street, ready to go home after a, a hard day's work. Pops into this little boy walking down the middle of the road. He's very disorientated. There's blood everywhere. He takes him to hospital. He doesn't know who he is. He doesn't know who his name is, where he's from. Mm -hmm. And that really shakes him to his core. And later on, when he's speaking to his girlfriend or his partner, that's when he sort of realises, look, I have to get out of this sort of funk I'm in. Also, there's tragedy around this character, Mm -hmm. which is established shortly afterwards, after the opening scene. So he's been in a sort of funk, not really ingratiating himself with neighbours and whatnot, and this is sort of the spark that connects him to the infamous Langs across the road Yeah, Stephen I loved this intro I thought it was absolutely magnificent it had tension it had real mystery right off the bat it was suspenseful and just brilliant brilliant emotional acting from Jeff Bridges when the actual nurse is asking him what's his name do you know who he is he's zoning out yeah that's, a good, that's a good part yeah I mean it's absolutely amazing yeah. acting from the guy it's so authentic and this is what I've come to expect for you, Jeff. I mean, he just pops up in every single genre you can imagine, yeah. from what the dude character to, I think he was in Bone Tomahawk. Iron Man as well. Iron Man yeah. to movies like this, and the man can do every single genre. Yeah. What was the other one? Was it uh, the one with Chris Pine and Ben Foster? Jesus Christ, he was in that anyway. That mm. was an incredible one. Uh, so I love this guy, and right off the bat, this had me hooked. Jeff Bridges acting stellarly. Yeah. And a great, intriguing little suspenseful story to start off. And of course, after that, they do establish the Faradays. But what was your thought um, on uh, that intro the first time you watched it? I think I've seen this movie before, Stephen. Yeah. I went into this thinking funny, I hadn't. Yeah. But there was moments that I remembered, yeah. so I'm pretty sure I've watched this before. It, it grips you right away, John. Uh, you know, the first five minutes of this film, you're pulled in right away. You really yeah. want to know what happens next and what happens after that and so on. And it, it just goes that way for the, for the entirety of the film. Yeah. Um, Jeff Jeff Bridges, um, 
I don't think there's many actors could have done pulled that off in the first five minutes. What he did in those first five minutes, yeah. you're right. The the range of emotions in this character, Michael, um, was amazing. And uh, as I said, you know, I've not seen this film in six years or something like that. But when you mentioned that zoning out in the hospital, yeah. I remember that. But you know, I, I do remember it. I just remember him. He was so focused on the well being of the child. Um, it's just um, it was just a great intro, you know. And there had to be some kind of um, incident to connect his family with obviously the um, langs you yes. know the langs um or the be- because they're so you'll find out obviously as you watch this film and obviously if you're watching this review you'll find out how so different they are as well oh yeah absolutely they're completely wired in different ways and that's established even when we do sort of set up the faraday family unit it's this dysfunctional unit there's a lot of tragedy within the father and son relationship. The mother's been killed. She's an mm. FBI. She was an FBI agent. Yeah. Dealing with counterterrorism sort of thing. She stormed a, a ranch and it went badly. She was killed. So the unit is just broken down. The dad's... I wouldn't say he's at odds with his son, but the son's oh. sort of resenting the fact that he's moving on. He's got a new girlfriend in the, yeah. the house. And he's obviously having trouble sleeping and whatnot. So we establish that family unit right away. You can see that he's a... He's sort of, sort of more in touch with his emotional side of things, and Michael, than obviously Oliver Lang, who's a sort of cold, calculated oh, yeah. guy. <laughs> and he's, he's got a touch of PTSD. I think that's why that shook him so much in the moment with the young son yeah. or the young boy, because he's remembering his wife and what happened to her. He couldn't save her. He's trying to save him, and it sort of took him back. Yeah. So again, it does. It, you can see how they're wired differently in the first ten minutes of the movie. And I love. It was almost like Train to Busan. Stephen starts with a bang. Literally, the deer gets hit, yeah. and they establish the young daughter and the father right away. Again, it's like this in this movie. Starts with a bang, it's suspenseful, and then it establishes your main sort of protagonist and his family unit very early on. It was just beautiful. And then, of course, we do, we meet the, the Langs for the first time, and right away, Tim Robbins is looking so shifty, so manipulative, yeah. and he's just a lying shit. I mean, it, and the way the camera lingers, this is something I was going to get into later on, but... This movie, just time and time again, I have to look up the cinematographer because he is yeah. superb. The way that they, they sort of <clears throat> focus out of Michael in the foreground and focus in on... Or make, in fact, it, Michael's in focus, but you can still make out maybe Oliver in the background. Yeah. And you can make out his little expressions, the way he's looking at him knowingly yeah. when he says, oh, he needs a friend and things like that. And he's calculating in his head how he can work that to his advantage early yeah. on. The way it just lingers on these these nefarious neighbour characters, it just sets the tone. Yeah. And I, I love that, man. I loved the establishment yeah, Jeff, of the Jeff family. Jeff Bridges has a line, doesn't he, where he says, thanks, neighbour, for having yeah. a 10-year-old son next door or something like that. Well, I'm pretty sure that was one of the lines. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. then obviously Oliver says to him, I mean, the world would be bad or something like that if you didn't have friends. Yeah. And he's giving them a little knowing look, and you just know he's not even remotely genuine yeah. with it. This family, would, they would fit right into that episode of the X-Files, the, you know, when the um, Mulder and Scully were the Petries. Yeah. I can't remember <laughs> what it's called. Um, I can never remember yeah, that I can one. remember that episode, but it was just that sort of creepy vibe off them, you know. Um, Joan Cusack in this film, I know we'll talk about performances later on, but um, you can't forget her in this film because she plays such a big part and such a mani- manipulative Fashion as well. Stephen, she um, reminded me the way she smiles and how false it is of the the wife in the Truman Show. Yeah, yeah. When she's doing yeah, that. That's what I was thinking. Yep. She's holding yeah. like the. This is a. Yeah. The, 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 what is it? Uh, something coffee. Yeah. It's the way she holds it and the way she just smiles and it's so false and pretentious. That's the vibe I got yeah. off of her. Yeah. It's just a strange, strange family unit and just polar sort of. I don't know. Polars apart. There's a creepy little kid in this as well, isn't it? A daughter or something like that. The daughter is terrifying, yeah, Stephen. She yeah. is like an extra from The Shining. <laughs> the little twins from The Shining. Absolutely terrifying the way her hair is done up. Yeah. Those eyes just staring out. She looks like a I don't know, something with bulging eyes. A little mini Marty Feldman. It's very, very strange. Clearly had Graves' disease. And I can say that because I suffer from Graves' disease. Not yet get the bulging eyes and I hoped never to have them either. But Stephen, they are they're so shifty, so manipulative. And also, there's a little moment early on where he's speaking about, oh, I grew up in Kansas, um, the family, I took them out west because they've never been out west before. And obviously, Michael, being the sort of intelligent guy he is, he's, he teaches counter-terrorism car- uh, classes. Mm-hmm. He spots a, a redirected mail with Oliver Lang, and it's from Pennsylvania or something. 
and right away he's saying, what's going on here? He confronts him about it, sort of jovially. That's even a word. Yep. Sort of brushes it off, Oliver, by saying, oh yeah, it's the, it's another another Oliver Lang. They've just got the address wrong at a reunion for Pennsylvania and he throws it on the floor. But that sort of sparks it because then there's little moments the relationship blossoms and I love that as well, the way that even then he's manipulating Michael. Yeah. He's saying, oh, your son was speaking to me about your wife and whatnot and he's like, oh, he spoke to you about his mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's okay, isn't it? We don't have any secrets, us. He's speaking away. He's manipulating him. Yeah. He knows that he's a sort of damaged guy. He was crying in his house the night before and stuff like that. And even this early on, he's manipulating him to his sort of his way of at his will. He's, he's obviously planning a big bombing and he's just using and abusing everyone around about him who can perhaps be useful in it. And of yeah. course, as you see at the end of this movie, Michael's incredibly useful for Oliver. And I just love that man and the way that the seeds of doubt are slowly planted into Michael's mind. He sees another letter redirected. He says this time, look, I'm going to investigate this. And he doesn't like how close his son's getting to it and stuff like that. I just love that, Stephen. Yeah. I don't know what your thoughts were. Just the way that it almost turns into an investigative sort of detective movie. Yeah. But he's hunting down this guy's true identity. What's going on? Why is he getting these redirected mails? And it's just the way he, he discovers the Michael Fenimore sort of alias, the terrorist identity, the fact yeah. he was a right winger who tried to blow up a post office when he was 16. There's one thing about this film, John, and you'll think this throughout, is, you know, if Michael didn't discover the boy walking down the middle of the road, how this would have played out, would it have played out any differently? Mm-hmm. Or was this the plan from the beginning? Or did the plan come more into play You know, when we get to the end of the film? Or um, was Michael... Just a completely delusional, paranoid schizophrenic. Yeah, and you've got all these things in your head. You know, I think it's very clever that he's a, a you know, he's a widow. Um, he's grieving. He's not over it. He's not going to go over it. You know, he's he's got um, you know, a son who is disconnected from him as well. He's teaching a class about how uh, you know these movements, these groups, these right wing movements uh, that resulted in his wife's death. Yeah, so it's you all know, personal. So a, and it, it also. He's almost portrayed as an obsessive guy, you know, he's obsessed with this, um, you know, this line of um, terrorism and it does, it's deliberate, it's to plant these things in the audience's head yeah. that we don't know if this guy is unhinged, we don't know if this guy is correct in his findings, is he just overly paranoid, you know, because, that, I mean, there is always that vibe from the Tim Robbins yeah. character and the Joan Cusack character that there was something not right with them but we just didn't know what it was at this point in the film yeah. and it's it's just great the way those little seeds are dropped you know I, I think it's very important to establish very early on that uh, Michael is a good guy he is a good guy he's a tragic guy yeah. in this film by the end of it oh yeah but um, he, he is a good guy that I think that's why that scene is very important at the very beginning taking the boy to the hospital yeah. because you've got to establish right we know our good guy in this or do we you know, that's the way it goes. It's kind of up and down for maybe the first hour of this film. You don't know how to take them. One thing's for sure is Oliver and his wife, you can't trust them, but you don't know why at this point. Yeah, you know? Stephen, look, it wouldn't surprise me if Oliver or William Fenimore, if he's, 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 as is his true identity, it would surprise me if he manipulated everything, that he yeah. put his just, son in danger, yeah. damaged his hand just to force him into the road so he could then manipulate Michael and have this whole bomb attempt at the FBI office in Washington play out exactly how he envisaged it to be playing out. It wouldn't surprise me, given the way the guy operates in the movie, if that was what happened. But as you did say, it's so beautifully weaved the story that you genuinely could look at it from both viewpoints. I was going to speak about that later on, but it is just the way it weaves... You can understand the rationale of people around about Michael what, when what plays out at the end, as I'm sure we'll get into later, yeah. it plays out why they form the view of him that they do. It's completely understandable. Us, sort of the fly on the wall, looking in from afar, we can see both sides of the, the coin. Yeah, We understand that he's an innocent man. Well, I believe he is anyway. That's my take from it. And that the Oliver Lang character and his wife and the family are completely dysfunctional. They're absolute terrorists, domestic terrorists. Terrorism. Terrorism. And they're up to no good. And when they obviously form that viewpoint later on, you're raging. You're like, what are you talking about, you lunatic? Have you not been around this man? And none more should that be evident, Stephen, when they sort of manipulate this scene later on as well. But the brilliant scene when Michael takes his, uh, his sort of students on an excursion trip to the scene of where his wife died to show them how 
The <sighs> FBI are not infallible. They can get things wrong. They stormed a ranch, mistaking it for a terrorism sort of thing, a, a domestic terrorism thing. And they got it hideously wrong and three people died. A young boy died. A, another son died. His wife died. The acting in this and the intelligence and the way that it reveals to the audience how his wife died, how he's in the state he is just now emotionally. Yeah. I loved it, man. I loved the, the performance yeah. from Jeff Bridges in this scene. It's just incredible. He's trying to hold it together whilst teaching his students, but you can see he's almost crying and stuff yeah. like that. And again, just early on, the man flexing his acting muscles. Just well, again, superb. John, it's good, great writing as well. You know, as as much as the performance is bang on, it's on the money. Um, it's very emotional as well. Yeah. Um, it's it's really to the scene before you're getting a, a little glimpse of what Michael's sort of frame of mind is. He's paranoid. He's suspicious about his neighbours. Mm -hmm. And then the next scene, you know, he's an emotional wreck. We're feeling sorry for him again. Yeah. You know, we've, we're getting all these range of emotions from this character. They're all. Uh, positive towards him you know um you're concerned about him um but you're seeing it unfold i think the flashback was important i think it was it was important to see the severity of the uh, you know his wife's death yeah. and how um poignant and and it was a turning point in his life um uh, you know and um you can only imagine the decline in his mental health as well at this point and you are thinking these things as you're watching the film up to this point as well so yeah again I, I know i'm repeating myself here john but it's again it's just the writing it's really taking you on this journey with michael and um you said that flying the wall that's exactly what you are in this film yeah. you're just kind of sitting back from afar you're looking at both sides of the fence and seeing trying to weigh up you're trying to weigh up, uh, right? Michael's a good guy. Yeah. You can see he's a good guy, but Slightly there's something a bit, something not quite right with him, you know. Uh, and it does put the doubt in your head whether or not Oliver is what perhaps he's suspicious uh, or what he thinks he is. Yeah. Um, but it doesn't take long. It doesn't take long, John, to we start to see little clues that this Oliver guy is a real deal. That he's not Oliver. And he he has got a plan in place. Absolutely, Stephen, and none more so is that evident in the sort of next sequence in the movie when it, the whole identity switcheroo thing is revealed that he swapped places with the real Oliver Lang in Kansas. I think it was 1981. He was killed in a hunting accident, mm. and obviously William Fenimore, who is played as the real Tim Robbins character, he swaps his identity with the dead Oliver Lang the day after he dies. So there's no overlap. He can forget his past, and people will not be really be able to go back and check out the Oliver Lang name prior to 81 and find anything suspicious. It's so intelligent, but the way that Michael discovers it again, it's almost like a, a Columbo episode. Yeah. He's using his contacts at the FBI, he's getting back and phoning up numbers yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. And just this toe curling scene, Stephen, when he, he tries to kid on to the little girl that he's forgot his keys or something, he's locked out, he has to come in and use the phone to yeah. phone a locksmith. And that moment in the study when the Joan Rivers, is it? Uh, Joan, Cusack, Cusack, yeah. Joan Cusack, I always want to say Joan Rivers, I don't know why. When she stumbles on him yeah. and he's in the study and he's looking at the picture, Stephen, I was cringing. Yeah. I, I had my, my hand Is this a blueprint? Yeah. yeah, the blueprints. Yeah, yeah. I was actually had my hand in my, yeah. or my head in my hands just crying with absolute <laughs> cringe yeah. at this guy being caught. And the way he tries to play it off, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, sorry, I was just, it was squinty, the picture, that I was trying to sort it. And then the little girl handing him the phone as well when he goes out, that was the final kick in the nuts yeah. for this sort of cringe while they seen. I love that about this movie. There's some array of different emotions being brought up to the surface, as you did say. You feel pity, you feel poignancy, there's yeah. sadness, there's excitement. There's absolute cringe. But this this it point, grapples different genres. Yeah, this, this, this is the point, though, you start to go, maybe Michael's onto something now. Maybe this Oliver guy that you know lives in Pennsylvania, um, it's not the wrong address. It's not the, the yeah. they've got it mixed up in the mail. You know, this is when you start thinking he's onto something here. There's something behind this family. There's something not. We knew there's not. There's something not right with them. We just thought they were a bunch of weirdos. Too uh, nice. You know, yeah. yeah you know, <laughs> family <they're... laughs> photograph as well. <laughs> wow. Uh, it's too perfect. Yeah. It is. You is that, yeah. Steve, I recall photos like that. Uh, it's like something like out of Pleasantville, isn't it? Yeah, it's photograph. just ridiculous, man. Um, they're too shiny. But you're too right, happy. John. Uh, there's always those scenes that you get in thrillers where someone's like breaking into an office to look in a filing cabinet and stuff. I always cringe at that because um, normally what they would do is they would interslice the scene with the person that might yeah. catch them but and that's they don't they don't really do it that much and normally the person gets away in time 
and yeah. this occasion he gets caught yeah. and it happens time and time again yeah. the Langs have this propensity this ability for sneaking up behind our characters yeah. they do it with the wife later on as well they just seem to be a step ahead at every moment and Stephen what he says it's, it does it reveals that they are dodgy shits that he is has got a, a history that he, and everything isn't so shiny happy as he's trying to project out shiny happy, happy yeah I've got people. REM in my mind I says it previously there as well I can't help it Michael Stipes you absolute git blubbering as those ear woman juicing songs but what it does man even again it's so intelligent because even when it's setting up that they are the, like these these wrongings have got a dodgy past just as that happens he falls out with his girlfriend over the matter over him sort of trying to show her look here's the evidence yeah. he's got a past he's changing his identity he doesn't want me to see these blueprints these plans even he's showing her pictures of him with his history he, he bombed a yeah. post office when he was 16 this leaves, leads her to stamming, ramming out of the sort of, that's even the yeah. correct terminology, out of the house. But, and he's on his own. He's open to manipulation again. And it's almost yeah. as if the Langs are deliberately leading him down but, this path but to get shows, where they want. It shows how much all of us under their skin by this point, you know, that she can't see past this family at this point. Um, and that's that's just down to a good sort of manipulation. Um, that the, the FBI guy, I actually forgot about him, but... Again, he has he has his doubts about Michael as well, and I think this all boils down to his mental health. Yeah, um, he, he's he's doubting him throughout the film, as I recall, John. Yes, um, yeah. And it's the same with the girlfriend as well. You know, it's as if they they try to look after him, and they they think that he's a bit, you know, he's a bit fragile. Fragile, yeah. That's a probably unstable. that's probably the best word. Unstable, yeah. Um, so again, you know, he's not really got anyone on his side. I feel the character of Michael throughout the film is very alone. Although he's surrounded by a girlfriend, he's got his colleagues in the, the FBI, he's got his son. I think he's very alone in yes, this film yeah. f- from the, the very beginning to the very end. Stephen, you see it? When they're over having the sort of the party, the dinner party at the Langs early on in the movie, <clears throat> he's with his girlfriend, he seems happy, he's, he's joking, he's having conversation. Then he just slips down a dark sort of area and he's subconscious. Yeah. He starts speaking about his wife and that's him. He's sort of zoning out again so he is he's a deeply unhappy deeply sort of lonely figure yeah uh, he's, he's disconnected from his son he's got no real friends he's lost his wife he's not in a good place at all this guy and that's why he's just a perfect pawn for the langs i just feel like throughout the whole movie they're manipulating him exactly to where they want him to be they're moving people out of his life and the girlfriend and the son later on yeah just making the guy on his own be on his own manipulating him to go to the fbi Everything's just been worked to the whims of Oliver Lang. Tim Robbins is an absolute puppeteer, <laughs> master in this movie. It's, yep. He's magnificent. And Stephen, <laughs> none more do you see the magnificence of Tim Robbins when we have this garden confrontation. Yeah. And he Again, I mean, he goes to the, the building when he's doing research work on him and yeah. he sneaks up behind him. And again, they just have this ability to sneak up. They're almost like... It's like they are the Phantom Menace, these, these two characters, the wife and the husband. Yeah. They know where everyone is that they... They've got their eyes on, and they seem to be able to sneak up. At sort of, I don't know. They can sneak up behind them at any moment. Yeah. And he does. He sees him looking. You think has he seen it? The newspaper clipping. Yeah. He's like, oh, that's a Kansas <clears throat> Gazette or something. I remember reading that when there was a son. I think Michael says to him, yeah. I mean, I, I do. I get counter terrorism classes and whatnot. And I heard there was a case in Kansas, and I'm looking into it. And that's again him just letting him know. I know yeah. about your past. I'm onto you. But the confrontation in the garden afterwards, when he confronts him, yeah, and it again, he's just it, it, the way that the acting's incredible between these two guys, first and foremost. But he's so convincing. I don't think Oliver at any point thinks, um, I'm, I'm going to just have to keep covering this up. No, he, he, he knows this point is going to come at some point. I'm going to ask you something, John. See yeah. the, the 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 picture frame and the little bit of corner. Tore away. Yeah. Do you think that was deliberate? Absolutely deliberate. Because There's no they're, way. They're, they're pulling them in. Yeah. You know, and they know at some point they're going to have to. They know that Michael's not a daft guy. He's not. You know, he's he's a very clever guy. Um, they know at some point there's going to be the confrontation. They know that at some point they're going to have to say, yes, yes, this is us. This is what we're doing, and this yeah. is what we're going to do. Uh, blah blah blah. Um, you know. Um, but it's very interesting that I think you're right. I think that. Oliver and his wife are in control from the very yeah. beginning of this movie. Um, throughout it, you do think that. You do think 
that little tour, uh, you know, tear at the it's corner. It's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that's very that that much important to this this organisation, this right wing yeah. organisation, leaving that little bit on, you know. Well, even Michael general. suggests at the start that he's testing him, he's prodding him to see if he's an ally or an enemy, on sort of sort of like the political and the government conversation. Yeah. Speaking about the wife and the way she died and whatnot, he's saying, oh, well, I mean, they deserve to be punished. He's sort of at pushing and prodding Michael to see, are you with me or are you against me? When he discovers he's against him, then he's just manipulating him to his whims and just setting yeah. him up beautifully. And even though I hate the character, man, he's an absolute shithead. Yeah, he's great, You have though. to respect yeah. the, the cerebral sort of way in which he just, everything just comes together. And he's doing it in broad daylight. He doesn't care. The wife spe- spots him in the garage. It's mixing or swapping the briefcases, she ta- fo- follows them, if I can speak. I was mm. about to say tailgates, but she doesn't. Yeah, but she's too close. I mean, it's so obvious. He must. A man of that intelligence is going to notice that number plate and know she's following me. And again, the wife jumps up straight afterwards and they do her in. Yeah. But yeah, too I mean, late. Stephen, absolutely, yeah. man. They've, they've worked him like an absolute pawn in a chess game. Done him up like a kipper. Yeah, done him up like a kipper, as yeah. uh, they say here. Kippers are truly tremendous smoked. Uh, I can't mm-hmm. I think it's Haddock. Uh, fishies, I grew up eating them, they're absolutely magnificent, that's another tangent, but if you can get your hands on a kipper and you like fish, please do so. Smokies. Smokies, yes, absolutely, kippers are mackerel, sorry yeah. I get that wrong. Our broth, Steve, isn't it? Our broth, man, yeah. uh, Steve, now you eat everything, man, everything, eyeballs a lot. But from oh, our broth to Arlington Road. Yes, Arlington Road, man, <laughs> the garden confrontation, Stephen, yeah. what a magnificent scene, man, the two men are bouncing off each other, and he is so convincing with his sort of explanation. Yeah. His father lost the farm, it sent him into poverty, he ended up killing himself with a tractor and framed it like an accident, he he wrote him a note, and this is why he had all this pent up anger and he wanted to fight back against the authorities and blow up the post office and whatnot, but he was a 16 year old, he was naive, he's a changed man, I wanted to get away from it all and have a bright future where people weren't snooping into newspaper cuttings and whatnot, it was my best friend Oliver Lang, I took his name to honour him. Things like that. He's so convincing. He's such a shyster. It's a magnificent scene. You know he's lying through his, his teeth, but look, man, as I say, this guy could be the sneakiest bee ever. And I love him in it, man. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I love him in it. Yeah. I love villains like this. You can understand their reasoning. He's just, he, he doesn't, I mean, he, there's probably a degree of truth in his alibi <laughs> about changing the name. Maybe he did have an upbringing like that and his father was yeah, yeah. killed and this is why he's so hateful and want to fight back at the authorities. But I just love these sort of intelligent John, villains. Uh, John Cusack. I said John there. John Cusack. I said um, John Rivers. So. Um, this, is a, this is a really... Um, you know, this is the point where she's consoling him as well, isn't she, for the death of her girlfriend? Yeah, she kills the... They, they yeah. frame the wife's death as an accident. So it shows you the, the sort of lengths that these, this couple will go Not to. Not the wife, the girlfriend. Know. Yeah, the girlfriend, yeah. Um, and again, it shows you... Um, just what a great actor Joan Cusack is as well. Um, that she can go from, you know, almost creepy. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying almost creepy. She is creepy. The two of them are so creepy in this film. Um, Stephen, I'm to led to believe she was a comedic actor before this as well. So this was yeah. sort of a, a step in yeah. a, a sort of different direction yeah, for her, this I, movie. I would say so. You know, she was in um, School of Rock, wasn't she? Yeah. Um, she's very good in that as well. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, we, we talk about Jeff Bridges when we talk about Tim Robbins, but Joan Cusack is in... I think she's an equal par with these two actors as well. Um, she's not got as much to do in the film, but every time she's in a scene, she kills it. Every time, yeah. you know. And she's just, and that that's probably the the scene for me that I remember so much is the what a devious cow you are, you know. <laughs> you, you've done her in now. You're consoling the boyfriend. Yeah, that's low. That's as low <laughs> as it gets. It really is, man. It was a magnificent yeah. scene, and again. They're saying she was a lovely, lovely person and stuff like that. <laughs> Cameras, again, worked beautifully. It's lingering yeah. on their faces. You can see they're looking at each other. And they're like, we've got this guy exactly where we want him. He's in the palm of our hands. Just everything's just beautifully worked in this movie, man. Just on a technical level, on a script level. I love it, man. And then Michael, I mean, he sort of <clears> thinks, <throat> right, they're okay, these guys. I've got them all wrong. I have went off at the edge of sort of a paranoid trip into madness. <laughs> I'm back. And then something happens. I think I, I think it may be the call from his friend at the FBI about messages being left. And he's like, I didn't leave you a message. I didn't phone you up. And that sends him down the sort of paranoid yeah. route again. He looks outside. Someone's working on the cable or something. And he goes off, I believe, in like a flying trip halfway across the United States. He goes to Kansas to look into this 
a bombing or something from Kansas. The the dad of the the boy that get convicted doesn't think he worked alone, and he thinks he suspects Michael Fenimore was working with him. And that takes him there. It unveils the sort of Boy Scouts or the sort of catalyst for this group and whatnot. Yeah. He goes and rushes <clears> to try and get his son. Discovers he's already been taken and he's been brought back home. He rushes back home. It's a sort of hundred mile an hour sequence. The music's sort of unnerving. Stephen, yeah. that I talk again, <clears> speaking <throat> about camera work, we'll get the technical stuff out, out the way just now. Okay. When he first sort of pops up in Kansas, the, the camera work in that scene is just sublime, man. One yeah. of the best shot scenes I've ever seen. It starts from up in the sky on a building or something and it swoops right all the way down and comes right into shot with Jeff Bridges in the centre of the shot. All beautifully fluid, unbelievable yeah. shot. But what did you make about that sequence, Stephen? And then the sort of realisation that Oliver Lang's taking his son, he's got him exactly where he wants him, he's playing yeah. him like a fool, and just the absolute, I've says the LSD trip of a party sequence when he comes back home, they're having a garden party. It's crazy, man. It's, it's how I'd imagine John Lennon and McCartney and whatnot on acid to have mm. been late back in the 60s. That, that's how that party this is sequence. A, a sort of hugging. Scene, yeah, he's hugging it? him yeah. and it pops to outside yeah. and it looks as though he's having a great time. And you get he's, everyone laughing yeah. as if, oh, look at the guys, they're having a good time. <laughs> he's that? whispering yeah. in his ear and telling them, you just stay in line if you want to see your son again. If yeah. you want to live, yeah, this is the point do exactly what I'm John. telling you because yeah. you're not in danger. It was coming though. It was, yeah. uh, you know, I don't like to say it's a predictable scenario, but uh, without it sounding negative, but it had to come. You know, the, there had to be stakes and the, the, the only, you know, the girlfriend's away now, so the only other person in his life is his son. Although he's not that connected to his son, you know, obviously he's still his son at the end of the day, you know, and he loves him and he cares for him and uh, Oliver knows this, you know, and now he's he's using the son obviously as, um, as leverage to keep him in line as you say, you know, but it's a, it's a good scene, but uh, you did see it coming. Yeah, absolutely Stephen, just, uh, again it just shows you that, again it's framing that this is a sort of two-way thing, you can see that they are sort of nefarious, but it's all through a sort of, there's a, there's a term for it, <clears throat> A, a narrator, a dodgy narrator, in a sense, this has been framed through Michael, and you could see it from the other side of things that he's paranoid, he's went off the edge, he's losing the plot essentially, he's grief stricken from his wife, he's never got over it, and he's seen these things in his imagination and they're sort of playing him. We know as the audience that's not true, no, but for in world sort of reasons, y- you can see it from the other perspective, yeah. And the, the, Stephen, that's the one thing, my one great with this movie, they could have framed this story just a little bit better and left some ambiguity surrounding the sort of motivations of the characters and a way I'd have preferred Oliver Lang or Michael Fenimore not to have had that scene where he out and out admits yes I'm doing this you can't do anything about it if you want to live and see your son again you'll do exactly what I tell you to do you'll not involve yourself in my business again if they just admitted that and left a a sort of degree of ambiguity yeah but the ending then you would have yeah it would have been so open ended that they've been borderline infectionist yeah, in a way, I probably would have. No. Yeah. See, see, Kevin, our fellow movie ended. burner, who's also my brother, by the way, yeah. um, we watched this together back in 1999 or 2000, whenever it came out in DVD. And um, both of us had different sort of uh, experience for the ending. And, and you, you make a good point there. That's probably yeah. where Kevin's coming from. He's probably thinking of the frustration of the, the ending. Yeah. Whereas I thought, I've never seen a film like this before. I'm sure there's been films before that have ended this way where... Spoiler alert, that you know, the bad guys win the day. Yeah. Um was not this, many. this was probably the first time I'd seen that. I don't think I've seen many films since that have no. done it this way. But you're right. It's a ballsy you know, move. If they kept things a little bit more mysterious, yeah. you know, at this point in the film, it it does kind of give you a different perspective on the ending if you think that way, you know, because yeah. you're thinking were they bad? You know, were yeah. they terrorists? Especially when they're walking back into the garden. Yeah. You're like, were they good people that were just framed as these monsters by this guy who's lost the plot? He's an absolute paranoid, schizophrenic mess. If they'd made it just a little bit more ambi- ambiguous, that's the word, it may have been a little bit better. But uh, Stephen, I love the movie, man. I loved what they did with the story. Yeah. And in a sense, making him this out and out monster. And making Michael aware of it, whilst everybody else around about him isn't aware of it. And he's completely helpless. He's the only guy that can stop it. He's the only guy that's aware of what's going on. And the way they, they manipulate it and make him out to be the bomber at the end and just frame him for everything whilst they walk away, yeah. it, it does, it makes you feel absolute rage. But we'll get into that in a moment. 
Uh, because we are building up to the finale now in the review, anyway. But it's just, it's magnificent the way that they frame the story. Stephen, I love the finale for all the <coughs> reasons I just said, really. I'm going to just completely repeat everything I've just said. Yeah. It all leads to this sort of bombing of the FBI building. He discovers that the these vans... Yeah, the car chase, you're the van, talk, he's got his yeah. son in the van, he's the te- frantic. You talked about the technical stuff as well, John. I thought yeah. the car chase was fantastic, the way yep. it was shot. It looked like Eddie Hitler was driving the van. <laughs> you remember him, the bald guy with the glasses? Yes. Um, and also, um, this, that, that scout leader was there as well. He looked an absolute creep. He was an absolute paedophile. Yeah, the t- tinted yeah. glasses. Yeah, I thought that as well. Absolute um, paedophile. Yeah. Those milk bottle glasses, man. They just reek of Jimmy Savile. An absolute out and out pedo beast yeah. yeah i'm not mincing my words he, he, no. he looked horrendous the fact he was smiling with the sun outside the van, the van yeah just bizarre yeah. man a bizarre character yeah. bizarre bizarre there was no need for that whatsoever that took it to a level that, that my brain didn't that's really away. just to bring michael's sort of stress levels yes. up higher you know yes, this i've got my abs- son yeah they're bombing this building yeah. he's with an absolute pedo i have to get this sorted now i I'm have to get to the fbi I'm, building i'm losing the plot here meanwhile <laughs> They are just playing him like an absolute fool because as is revealed in the finale, the bomb is not in the the, the actual van that he's chasing. It's in the boot of his yeah. car and he's just drove it straight into the <clears> FBI <throat> building and he has them searched the van. It's empty. And, and Stephen, again, I'm getting ahead of myself. I loved the car chase as yeah. well. It was beautiful the way it was shot. The, the sort of crash with the lorry or something or the bus. Yeah. The way he speeds off, he's going <clears> on <throat> pavements. The way the camera's following it. The technical level of this movie is just absolutely brilliant and the finale is absolutely brilliant as well the way that he reali- the moment he realises shit the bomb is in my car he runs towards yeah, it I don't know why he runs it. towards it though Yeah, it's like why I think he almost wants the mystery over they've played with him that much Yeah, he's a broken man he wants it to come to an end he wants to see where things are ending is it in my car have they played yeah. me like an absolute fool I think they, it, he almost sacrifices yeah, himself sl- to find it's, out it's a very long sequence in that underground car park bit as well yeah. I felt it went on forever John as I recall um, running. Yeah. you know they were um, w- you know they were st- restraining him uh, the FBI friends saying let him go etc etc and then it's a slow motion run back to the car you're right I think at this point he was just absolutely gone yeah. you know I think <laughs> he, he knew he, he knew that he, they uh. broke uh, the wool over his eyes that they got the better of him and it was probably the best way to go the sad thing is John <laughs> what's the best way to the, go yeah just end it you know end because it. <laughs> he's broken you've yeah, lost you, yeah it's just it's, 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 it's such a tragic end uh. as well you know because um as tragic as his death is, it's how it's more his memory that yeah. annoys me. How people are going to remember this yeah. guy for all the wrong reasons. I know yeah. you've mentioned about the media and stuff like that, John, which we'll get into in a little moment. But the car chase scene was fantastic. It shows again that you know if you can nitpick and go, um, this is too perfect. You know they've got that bomb in that car. How do they know he's going to get to the FBI building? How do they know he's not going to crash that car before then? It's going to blow up. Yeah. in the middle of the street, halfway down the you know the journey, everything just sort of falls into place throughout this film. And if you want to really nitpick, you could say it's too perfect, you know, and yeah. that kind of thing. But I think just because of the, the sort of dramatic levels in this film between Robbins and um, your man Michael, um, uh, cut, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Bridges. <laughs> See, I, I'm always about to say Jeff Daniels. So uh, Jeff Bridges, you know, and I think just be, just the Russell. sort of. Um, dialogue and emotions be- that are bouncing back and forth between us. He kind of just it doesn't matter. It's, it's it's not really that important. It's you know um, if it was just a, an action film or something like that, you'd be going, ah, oh, this is too perfect. It's too corny and stuff like that. But because it's not an action film, it is more of a thriller. You kind of just let that slide. Yeah. Um, you've got to because it is a fantastic ending. And I'm going to ask you this as well, John. I know you said you can remember maybe seeing this film years and years ago. Yeah. Um, I remember my first time watching this. I never suspected for a moment that that bomb was in Michael's car. I thought this was going to have a good ending, yeah. a, a happy ending, I should say. It's got a good ending, um, but not the satisfying ending that most people would expect. Yeah, Stephen, well, you did warn me that the ending would infuriate me, and you were absolutely right. Yeah. I didn't suspect that he was played that much that they actually planted the bomb in the yeah. car for it was maybe going to a different location or something. So when the penny dropped, it was quite a, a moment. I do remember little bits and bobs of the movie. I didn't recall the ending though, so it was sort of fresh in my mind when yeah, I watched it. That's good. Really enjoyed it. Uh, I really enjoyed the sort of shot of uh, Mike, uh, William Fenway. Uh, that is his name, isn't it? He's Alves? on the roof, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he's on Boom. the roof, yeah. overlooking. He's almost like a a Godfather-like figure. Over. Yeah looking his work and saying right that's it done 
Yeah, you the sad thing home. is as well that his son just kind of, I think he comes out the car or van or whatever it is and just goes, runs right over to Oliver's son yeah. and they're just skipping along all happy and stuff like that. I don't know if that scene was important. Anyway, I, yeah. I, I take it from an audience point of view, you know the son's going to be okay, I suppose. Well, apart from maybe getting his hand blown off yeah. and his thumb blown off, you know, he'll lure someone else but in, you know, to do the He's the almost job. freed from his son to his father, because yeah. his father's just completely gone, in a sense. That's he's lost tragic, his will yeah. to live when he's lost his wife, and then he loses the girlfriend and he's really gone, so there wouldn't really have been a life for the son, so in a sense, the son's been freed, he can go and maybe live with relatives or something who devote more time to him. So maybe that's what it was about. But Stephen, you're right, ridiculous reports I've says and I've says another yeah, word which I'll not repeat in the media afterwards. I just thought that was a great sort of satirical look mm. at the sensationalism of modern day media, twenty four seven news cycles, the way they just latch on to tragedies and even if it's not true, no. They're framing someone up like they do with Michael in this case. They just they go all in. They get people round about who knew him they're just lying through their teeth like that little well, bitch uh, who was saying it. I mean, he says this and she kind of smiles at the camera. Yeah. That happens in real life. Yeah. We've seen it with Richard. I said I spoke about Richard Jewell. That was a real life incident where guy was a hero. He saved hundreds, if not thousands, of people from being from being killed by a nail bomb. I think it was the ninety six Atlanta Olympics. Yeah. And he gets framed as a monster. The, the FBI suspect he was responsible. The media cycle they absolutely have this guy as being a, a mass murderer, a potential mass murderer. The students as well were interviewing the students, him, yeah. you know, and I think um, that's probably the sad part about it for me is that, uh, you know, these um, students looked up to him, you know, and rightly so. He was a very intelligent man yep. with, you know, a lot of um, education behind him in that field. And, you know, um, sharing that sort of knowledge with these students, it's a gift in a sense, but, yeah. you know, and there's that sort of student teacher trust as well, Um that's all gone, you yeah. know. That's all gone. They, they start to find holes in Michael's character. Well, he did say that. I suppose he was very passionate about that. Yeah. So I suppose, in a way, yeah, he could have done this, you know. And that's a, that's a tragedy for me. That's yeah. a tragedy for the Michael character. It's not the actual, you know, his his limbs and all are splattered over the walls at the end of this. It's his memory, you know. It's yeah. it's how people remember him. They'll always Probably remember him as a yeah. as a terrorist, you know. Yeah, and his wife lost her life to sort of counter terrorism, and now he's lost his life to it. sort of poeticness in that yeah. it loops and there's poetry and emotion it was it was a great ending I really enjoyed yeah. it what I didn't enjoy though was the sight of the Langs looking over at the boarded up house of their ex neighbour and the way they're just walking hand in hand back to the house they're selling up they're moving off to another town to cause absolute carnage perhaps with another neighbour yeah yeah right Stephen it's totally unique I ain't seen a movie like it in my life it does that with the ending it takes the traditional antagonist the bad guy flips it around and ha- has them have the sort of atypical or typical good ending, the sort of fairy tale ending where they walk away and <coughs> everything's all right for them. It was strange. The, the the closest comparison, I keep going back to it, it's not the same because they're not antagonists. Technically, the Storm's the antagonist, but Perfect Storm, we've got those trawlers out yeah. trying to make a living. They get all get killed yeah, there's another, with the Storm. There's another film that springs to mind as well. It has a kind of frustrating ending, but it's a, a really good ending. It's a skeleton key. Yeah. I don't know if you recall that yeah. film from about, I think it's 2004 or something like that. Is that like Denzel? That. Uh, no, oh, I was that the other one? I can't remember. It's, uh, I can't remember. I may not recall um, it then. I'll have a look. Have uh, a look yeah, up. Goldie Hawn's daughter. I can't remember what her name is. Kate Skeleton something. Key. She's in it. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those frustrating endings, John. Um, uh, you know, I, I did Maybe see this. Maybe about the bone collector. Uh, yeah, I think that's where you were. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just one of these films that has such a frustrating ending. Peter Skarsgård. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, Kate Hudson. That's that, Kate Hudson, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's just one of those sort of um, pulling out your hair moments, isn't it? You know, you just go, I can't believe the ending of this film. But it doesn't stop you wanting to watch it again, hoping no. for a better ending the next yeah. time. <laughs> it's a bit like Steve McQueen, and you know, when he's trying to jump over those fences oh, with yeah, the bike. Man. This time that. he's going to do it, you know, but it never happens. But uh, it was a great ending, John. It's a very unique That's film. another movie, Steve. The Great Escape is exactly like that. The yeah. traditional sort of good guys. Some of them get away, but most yeah. of them perish yeah, in horrendous yeah, fashion. Terrible, terrible Gun ending. Down. Yeah. Is it Richard Attenborough's character gets gunned down? Yeah, him and uh, Gordon Jackson, yeah. yeah. Um, but well, maybe that'll be a movie review at some point. Yeah, as well. That's an absolute classic yeah. movie. I, w- I could watch that every night and yeah. never lose my sort of enjoyment that it, it brings to me. Stephen, themes explored in this movie, though, yeah. man. I mean, I'll be brief with this. I don't want to go, want to go, not want, that's a Scottish slang word. I don't want to go too far into it because it's a great little sort of mystery thriller movie. and but there is themes being explored. I mean, sort of the, the rise of extremism, I've said, in mainstream politics. This was 21 years ago. Yeah. 
we're seeing this creeping again and again and again. We've got the likes of Trump in power now. I don't want to see he's an absolute extremist because he's not the worst extremist. You can certainly understand the, the sort of viewpoint of people who support support him. I, I don't agree with it personally. No. But he's not an out-and-out Nazi. But we are seeing right-wing politics starting to seep into Europe and other parts of the world. And I think this exposes that rise of extremism in mainstream politics. Grief and paranoia sort of explores that in humanity, the sort of a human study, in a sense, of Michael. Mm. I say it's the fallacy of the American dream as well, skewed through two men's lives. So sort of that, that was something else I got from it. I don't know if you agree. This is just me looking deep again. No, no. But just, just the way that the American dream and this fallacy of it can shape people's lives for the worse or the better. Yeah. The Oliver Lang character wasn't probably a bad guy to start off with, but if it's indeed true what happened to him and his family, they lost the farm, that's hoping for a better life, hoping for riches, and it's turned to a rags to a riches to rags sort of story where he becomes embittered and he wants to fight the very state that he was hoping would lead him to a better life. Yeah. I'm getting deep and deep and deep. No, no, I, I agree with all that, John. I, I thought it was just, the, the way he explored themes was pretty cool. It was nuanced, it wasn't too on the nose, I enjoyed that. Performances, Stephen, man. I mean, this is really, for me, a three-horse race. Yeah. It's a two-horse race in a sense, but... Joan Cusack is a real contender too, as you did yeah. say. She's every bit as good when she's on the screen, but she's not got enough screen time for me no. to nab the top spot. I think it's between Bridges and Robbins. Tim Robbins, yeah. Jeff Bridges. Two absolutely brilliant performances of yeah. two very different characters. For me, Jeff Bridges nabs it because I just love the guy. I love Tim Robbins as well. But he just plays this terribly complicated, yeah. grief-stricken, really human figure. He's, he's got defects in his, his life. He's not a perfect guy. He's trying his best to have a good situation play out and he just he fails it's and it's a, just it's perfectly human I love yeah, it yeah I mean if you're going to force my arm pick one John Jeff Bridges for me as well I'm yeah. more of a Tim Robbins fan uh, you know as a you know uh, his formal, uh, filmography yeah. um, but I think uh, in this film Jeff Bridges he just plays this range of emotions throughout the movie you know and, and shows um, just how good an actor he is yeah. um, Tim Robbins is a fantastic actor no doubt about it uh, same with Joan Cusack you know but both Tim Robbins and Joan Cusack play very similar roles you know where they're, they're devious and yeah. you, they've got to put a front on that's as far as it goes Jeff Bridges on the other hand's character Michael um, he's got to take the, the audience on that journey he's the one that will you know lift the, the audience's spirits he's the one that will put doubt in the minds of the audience as well you know he's carrying the film he is you yeah. know, and um, that's why I would say Jeff Bridges yeah he's a troubled and he's a sort of yeah, he just it's a great performance. I love it. Yeah. I love Jeff Bridges. Yeah, I think I love um, him in this movie. I think mentioning the director Mark Pellington as well, John. Yeah. Um this was an amazing film. Um he's not if you look at his filmography, he's not really done a whole load nope. of films. He's more um famous for music videos with the likes of uh Pearl Jam, uh yeah. U two, um in excess, etc. You know, that seems to be where he, he started in ma- making music videos for like rock bands and, he- and heavy metal bands. Um, but uh, he also did the, what was that one called? The Mothman Prophecies as well. Yeah, like, I really enjoyed that film. This, guy, was this guy should have been directing some X Files episodes. Absolutely, Stephen. Be- I was going to say it. Because even the ending, it's almost Arlington X-Files. Arlington Road is very X Files. Uh, yeah. Arcadia was the episode, by yeah, the way. Arcadia. And um, the Mothman Prophecies as well was. Like a monster of the week yeah. episode of Exiles. This guy would have, sl- unless he did that, I've not checked his full filmography, but he would do a good job in Exiles. Stephen, it's funny you mentioned the, the skeleton key. Heron Kruger, the man who wrote Arlington Road, yeah. also wrote the skeleton key. Right, this guy's, there a, you go. This guy's a git. He's a git. Yeah. He's a man who likes to subvert, <laughs> get. subvert well, yeah. sort of expectations yeah, for an no, ending yeah. in a movie. Didn't He'd done that. the original ring, which was actually a pretty damn good, well, the original Western ring, yeah. which was pretty decent. He'd done the Brothers Grimm. He's done a lot of really good movies, a lot of terrible movies as well, incidentally, but Ghost in the Shell was okay. It was, it was okay. Dumbo actually quite enjoyed that Tim Burton version. He was involved in that. Yeah. I have to speak about the cinematographer. It was Bobby Bukowski. Uh, I, I don't know much mm. of the other movies he's been involved in, but look, he done a stupendous job in this movie. The way it was shot, it sort of carried the deviousness of the, the Langs up to another level because yeah. he was able to capture the little nuanced expressions and just the sneakiness of them. I like the score as well. Uh, Angelo Badalamenti was the scorist, the, the scorist, the composer. He'd done Mulholland Drive. He's done a lot of pretty decent movies, man. So. Yeah. I mean, all in all, technical mastery in this movie is off the charts. The, the yeah. performances are off the charts. The score, the, the screenplay is absolutely brilliant. It subverts your expectations, as I did say. Stephen, final thoughts in this film, man. I'm glad you 
sort of mentioned it in a sort of off the cuff yeah, remark when we were reviewing uh, Donnie Darko last yeah. week. I don't know how that came about. I think it was perhaps the ending. I probably Looking, have to watch. Yeah, an infuriating again, yeah. ending. I think yeah. it was because that was an infuriating ending in a sense too. Donnie Darko, poor yeah. Jake Gyllenhaal having to sacrifice himself for the greater good. I really loved the ending. I loved the way that it just flowed and ebbed and flowed. There was not really a a second that. It felt lost that it could have been cut out of the movie, apart from perhaps that elongated garage sequence that you mentioned. I just thought tonally it was great, the way it explored the themes it was great. As I did say, some amazing performances, really unique movie. I've not yeah. really seen a movie like this. It almost had elements of like a fugitive where he's hunting down the truth, yeah. and it had action elements, it had comedic elements. It was with the also that LSD trip of a party sequence. It had a little bit of everything. I really, really yeah. enjoyed it, man. Um, come back to 1999 again, John, just to sort of wrap things up. Yeah. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I can understand why this film is probably missed by so many, and I'm, I don't just mean because obviously it was put back six months and stuff like that, but just with the sort of, you know, blockbuster films that came out that year, you can understand why this one was probably missed by a lot of people. Not a lot of people talk about this film. Not a people that I know since 1999 know about this film either. It's got Jeff Bridges in it, it's got Tim Robbins, it's got Joan Cusack in it, and you don't know this film. It's a, And that's true, you know, it's it's just a fact that this film is very much like um, the Kevin Bacon one, Stir of Echoes. You know, another film that, unless you're a follower of the actor, you might you might have missed it. It's a very good film, a very good quality, a very good, well-written film. And um, this is a film that, you know, I've not seen in about six, seven years, and it's yeah. not because... It's a bad film or anything like that. It's a very frustrating film, but in a good way. It's something very unique as well. Um, I've not seen too many films where it leaves me very frustrated at the very end of this film. That's always a good thing, Stephen. Yeah. You don't want everything to be fairy tales and happiness and no. flowery and airy. Sunshine sometimes and rainbows. Yes, yeah, sunshine and rainbows. Sometimes you need a little bit of angst and frustration in your life because that's positive emotion to have as a human. If it was all good... and. It, be shite. You need yeah. some really low moments to really life? appreciate what is life flows on within you and and without you as uh, the the truly wise George Harrison once started back in 1967. But look, that's going to round up the review of Allington Road. Have you seen it? Did it fly under the radar for you, or did you manage to capture it? Uh, and its magnificence back in 1999 or perhaps in some point over the last 21 years what's your thoughts on this movie if you've got anything to say about it the performances who was your favourite Tim Robbins Jeff Bridges Joan Cusack you can comment below and let us know what your thoughts are down below about any of the various facets of this movie which perhaps tickle your fancy you can also like the video if you've enjoyed it and you can subscribe to the channel if you want to see us doing more movie reviews every Friday and movie news Monday through to Thursday in the odd little movie reaction as well and if you do you'll see us again on monday for mbe movie news bye bye guys